In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is good that we are here. I seem to always be given the grace of being able to speak to you either on the last day of the conference or on the day on which we happen to be celebrating the Transfiguration. So even though we don't get to say it, I'm prefacing you for tomorrow, I say it every time I come and speak to you, it is good that we are here. And it really is. And before we get into anything that we have to discuss today amid the craziness of having to be introduced by the pastoral council, council uh, president who just got married to a beautiful young woman who is in many ways uh, personification of this talk, uh, as I joke with him and have for a long time. Let's start with a prayer. We always start with a prayer. And before we begin with that prayer, I remind you that you have an opportunity today as I'm recognizing so many of you, and I don't know what you did today in particular, which makes you so attractive today. It may have something to do with the fact that I left my glasses someplace. <laughs> but on that, I want your souls to be all the more beautiful before God. And so if you've not yet had the opportunity, taken the opportunity to go to confession, that's what you need to do to be able to receive the indulgences which have been spread out throughout this entire week, that total remission of the temporal punishment due to sin, hopefully paying attention to Father Tuckerman's talk last night, you say, I don't want that for myself, I want to give it to Our Lady, and she knows which souls to apply it to that need it most. Because our Mother Mary takes care of me, because I belong to her. So... You have the opportunity today because we're at the end of this conference to be able to receive a particular indulgence. And I think it is a particularly graced indulgence if there can be more graced indulgences than other, which I'll leave that to the dogmatic theologians, which I'm not, to be able to discuss with you. All that's required now for you and I is to receive Holy Communion if you've not done so already today and to make sure that you pray these three prayers for the intentions of the Holy Father as Father described in his sermon this weekend saying that the prayers for the Holy Father are always the same. His great, his best, his most perfect of all possible intentions. No matter who the person of the Holy Father may be or may come to be in some future age. So let us pray right now facing the Lord upon our knees asking him for these graces. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning. Our Lady, most humble, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The title for today's talk, for today's sermon, is Modesty More Than Clothes Deep. And so shall be our topic for today. I begin with a quote from St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He says, We can say of the soul, Gaudiant bene nati. Gaudiant bene nati. Let the noble born rejoice. Whatever they do, whatever they say is pleasing because it in humility, simplicity, and beauty shine forth. Words of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, Gaudiant bene nate sunt. Let the noble born rejoice. So when we discuss today, there's a virtue of modesty. When we speak about, we need to know what the virtue of modesty is. By the way, in the back, can you hear me? Okay, if I need to speak louder, all you do is give me the thumbs up and move those thumbs up. And my voice will also follow, but hopefully my pitch doesn't either. I don't want to sound like one of those chipmunks that I used to watch when I was a little kid. Alvin, Simon, nor Theodore. Now, modesty. What is it? 
Modesty is a type of the virtue of temperance. Temperance being one of those four cardinal virtues which were discussed there. And modesty there is falling under the category of what it means to be a truly temperate person. Temperance is that which moderates those pleasures received by touch and taste. Something that we struggle with most as Our Lady in Fatima came to say that most souls fall into hell because of what? Because of sins not against prudence, not against sins against justice, not against sin against any of the other virtues in any way, but particularly it is sins against temperance and against holy chastity. Holy chastity. And so we must all the more guard against this one. What modesty does, modesty makes rational or reasonable the way in which you and I move with our bodies. And so we come to see here that it concerns every single one of our actions. Not just the way that we dress ourselves. I want to disabuse you of that notion saying that modesty has to do with clothing merely or with your exterior appearance. It's far more important that you and I, it concerns everything within. Modesty concerns our playful actions. When we're out there because we don't have balls for some reason, I don't know why, probably because Father can't afford them. Please give in your donations in some sort of way so we can get you something proper to play with, young men. Or maybe it's just funner to throw a water ball around. I don't know. I was a young guy too. I did all that stuff as well. So it concerns our playful actions, but also it concerns the food that happens to be on our plate or the way in which you and I pray. Hopefully we do so so often throughout the day. Modesty cares about the who, about the what, about the where, about the when, and even the why of everything it is that you and I do. And at a deeper, more profound level, modesty brings into right order our passions. Modesty in clothing and appearance is where we usually speak, and that only hits on the surface level, but true modesty governs our souls in how we move with our body with a suavity. I want you to use that word maybe, suavity. Use it sometime this week, suavity, and just show how much it is that you are more intellectually powerful than those who are around you, or just do it and tell Father about it. He'll tell me about it when we hang out next Thursday, and he'll tell me that somebody listen to your talk. And I'd really like to know that somebody listened to my talk. It'd be helpful because it's the last talk, and so it means it's the most important, right? At least I'm going to say so. Moving on. Here, at this deeper level, true modesty governs the souls in how we move the body, and this is where we are most challenged and where we want to dwell today. Now, I could certainly speak in so many ways about this particular topic here. I, I love it, and I... In truth, what I really want to do is I want to deliver to you seven impassioned lectures upon this very topic. You think we can stick around for that today? And I know the Traegers want it, but I'm not sure about anybody else. Seven lectures. I think we would be able to barely, barely scratch the surface and I can say, I've done my job. They understand what modesty is here in St. Stephen's Parish. Well, we have some problems with that. Maybe your attention span isn't that long. And, third, and thirdly, maybe... I may not be here within this state in seven hours, so seven, seven talks. So this isn't going to work out for us today. But what we're going to try to do is to show you in the course of this to feel that modesty is truly a great virtue. And I want you to see how necessary it is and how practicable modesty is for each and every one of us. No matter who we are, modesty is practicable for you. To understand, I want you to understand how to how unlivable life is if you and I are not living out true modesty. For example, you and I could discuss modesty in various topics. I could talk to you, give you a, a conference on modesty and decorum, or modesty in our vesture, our clothing, modesty in our appearances and our accessorizing. Modesty in relationship to humility. Modesty toward the clergy. And for you who are clergy who are here, you got to live out modesty as well. How should we live as modesty? That's the thing that gets me thrown out of my diocese if I ever talk about that. Modesty in this way. But also, we could give another topic on modesty as it relates to the traditional Latin Mass. I'd really like to do that in a lot of lectures in that way because there's so much that goes on there. Modesty in our participation at the Mass was the Second Vatican Council calls for participatio plenum conscientium atque actuosum. Meaning that full, conscious, and actual participation within the Mass. 
I'm talking about modesty and how it's lived out in our home life. Modesty, how it's lived out at work. Modesty, how you and I should engage in right and proper company keeping, which is courtship. All those things require modesty, and that's just to name a few of the lectures we could give. Now, I don't have those seven hours, but all of us need modesty. And all of us struggle with modesty. All of us are offended by the very concept of modesty. And so you might ask, well, Father, if that's the case, why did you choose this subject to be able to do so? Would it surprise you that I didn't choose it? And it sounds like some of you don't because maybe you know something. I did not choose this whatsoever. I was voluntold that I was going to do it. I didn't even offer my services in any way. I was just going through. That was just a couple of weeks ago, by the way. I mean, maybe like two weeks ago. I was told about this. I was assigned this topic and by whom? And, you know, some mysteries just can't be known. And so I will leave that up to your imagination about who could possibly do such a thing. He's not here, by the way. I'd like to think that formerly within this parish of St. Stephen's, I had a fairly good reputation. That here I was fairly well thought of from time to time upon occasion, dare I say, loved? Well, maybe we shouldn't go that far. Pretty well thought of. But after this talk, I don't expect that. I expect, and in fact, you're going to hate me a little bit. Maybe some of you a lot bit more, especially if I actually get to get some of the material and don't run out of time. Every one of you, and why? The reason is because of this. Because love hurts. Love scars. Love wounds. And love marks. If you know that, if you know that song, you can sing it along with me after Mass. Now, when we get into these things, love means that I must tell you the truth and I have to challenge you. And what's the point of speaking to you about anything if I do not challenge you in some way to grow to a better following of our Lord Jesus Christ? There is nothing else that's more worth it in life. And so modesty, what it does is it covers for you and I everything we say and do. Whether you're a teen or whether you're a tot, whether you're a young or more mature, mature adult, whether you've given yourself to any sort, of, uh, any sort of thing or way, modesty is something which touches on each and every one of us. And so we have to really take into account what this modesty really should be. Modesty touches on every strata of society. Whether you're sitting within the pews or up there within the choir loft, whether you're here in the sanctuary, most of the time, it hits on each of us. It doesn't matter what type of hat you wear, whether it's fit for the ballpark or for ranching or for Italian legitimate business, or whether yours happens to fit tightly around your ears and covering over the course of your head, shielding you, as it were, blinder so that you could focus only on what is godly in front of you whether it has three corners, like mine, or looks like the planet Saturn, Saturn or it actually consists of a, t a crown or even a triple tiara. It deals with you and I. So red and yellow, black and white, we got to get in line forever if we wish to blessedly remain forever in God's sight. So to review, what is virtue? Virtue, it is manliness. That's what the word means, manliness. It's acting in accord with your creation and my creation. Virtue is always something that is in action. Virtue is a habit in the will, but also or in the intellect. A habit means that we act generally in a particular way without struggle. It means that it has to be natural for us. It has to be easy. It's seen something that has to make you and I be truly joyful in the way in which we go forward. For if we struggle, if it's grating, and if we do it curmudgeonly, then we're not yet there. But we might get there when we overcome those things. Virtue is, as Father spoke about us at the beginning of our talk, virtue is the mean between two extremes, which are vices. It's not a middle point, it is a mean, so it's somewhere in there, and it's not in that middle point, but rather it rises high above. 
either extreme which is there. And so we always have to climb the mountain of virtue in order to actually arrive at what it is. It's a habit which means that we act generally in a particular way without struggle in that to make sure that we get there. Now, all that review, which was given to us in our first talk, brings us to now, which says, what is then modesty? Modesty is this. Modesty is the virtue in which our exterior actions, whether they be in deeds or in words, do mode is always to be observed. What it means is that it's about restraining the delight that you and I get from all the actions that we take. To make sure that we restrain them in the proper way. It's foolish musing and illicit. Foolish musing is illicit because these actions are done for the pleasure alone without any noble end. So we do think something just because it's pleasurable, just because we get excited about something like that, then that makes it illicit. We need to do things with intentionality and with action for it to be really virtue, seeing that it leads us to our final end, which Father Gruber talked about last night, discussing the virtue of prudence. He told me that I was supposed to, wherever he is, he said I have to mention him in some way during this. Uh, so I just did there. Uh, there you go, wherever you are. I think you're in the confession. Modesty is a kind of piety toward the self. And this is what a German philosopher by the name of Peter Wurst sends him out. It's very beautiful, mystical. You want, want to listen to it. Don't close your eyes if you're going to fall asleep. He says this. He says, Piety towards oneself surrounds the self like a delicate membrane which must be kept safe from harm if we want to protect our souls from being laid open to great dangers. Isn't this hitting on what Father Cibelli was talking about last time on the virtue of piety? Continuing on, Peter Verse says, Piety is a heavenly trust which within us, which we are bound to defend whenever a hostile power threatens to profane them. Our soul then is in its ultimate depths is a secret. And this is the inner chamber, the soul, which we are up to a certain point obliged to preserve religiously. Reverence for ourselves forbids us to unveil or to expose the sanctuary of our souls with a rash and impious hand. For to do so would be a real profanation and show an unforgivable lack of modesty. The inner chamber of your soul, brothers and sisters, should not be rashly exposed to any creature which is not divine. God isn't a creature, so what does that mean? Only God himself should have full and total access to the soul. Otherwise, it must be veiled within that piety that we have for our very selves, for our inner life, so that it may be all, dwell, all covered with this covering which is modesty. Now, modesty, brothers and sisters, is honesty. Modesty is honesty. It's really fun because it rhymes in that way. So modesty is honesty. But what does that mean? St. Thomas uses that word honesty. But it doesn't mean what you think it means. It's not integrity. It's not a lack of lying. But that is true, that it does have those qualities. We're going to talk about later, if we get to it, the act of simulation. And that is a very grave act against modesty and something that we have to help each other out to make sure that we're not lying with our bodies. So, honesty. The word that's used there is honestias. Honestias, which sounds like honesty, but it's not. It's something more, something deeper. Honestias means this. It's being, or rather, living in a way that disposes one to the practicing of all virtue. If you're going to be able to pray the prayers that Father Gruber printed out for us on acquiring all the virtues necessary for salvation, tons of things there in the back of the church, you need to have honestias which means you have to live in such a way that you can practice all the virtues, and that's what modesty does, brothers and sisters. Modesty is an essential virtue. It is essential virtue in this. It is a universal virtue. And what does universal virtue mean? It means this. It means that it touches every single aspect of your life and of mine. Every virtue 
becomes more itself, becomes more virtuous when modesty is added to it. Modesty unites all the virtue. Think of modesty as that very polish. We see these beautiful stones and beautiful altars and beautiful things which are here. The more you apply that polish on the outside, it becomes more and more what it is. Those accretions come off of it and that's what modesty allows it to do, to truly be what it is. Modesty unites all the virtues together. It is modesty that modifies the manner or the way in which each of the virtues is lived out. And so in this sense, modesty is a quasi or a kind or a type or analogically charity with regard to the way in which our modesty moves and goes through the world. So when you hear modesty, you can also think of the greatest of all these things, which is caritas, which is charity. For example, here's one. Fraternal correction. Not a fun thing to be able to talk about, right? Fraternal correction here. So... Say, for example, somebody is being a real jerk. That's the word I use, so I hope that's not offensive. That's me maybe being a little bit on the border of modesty there. So jerk. Somebody is a jerk there when they're serving within the liturgy. They're, maybe it's one of your MCs in some sort of way. Somebody's within the liturgy there, and they're being a jerk there, commanding you, do this, go there, try that, after you, one after another, after another, demanding exacting perfection from you when you're not quite there yet, or you're just not on your A game right there. And the more and more they berate you, the more and more they order you, the more and more they say, go here, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, with impatience right there, what comes over you is this desire to be able to take an action toward them. And that particular action that you might want to take against them might allow you to think that maybe I should uh, take my hand and make a quick gesture toward them to show them where their place is. Modesty is the thing which restrains you from doing it at that moment. And saving that fraternal correction for a different moment. So you don't reach out and punch that person, especially if he's a priest, by the way, because you get excommunicated if you strike a priest out of anger. You know that, right? So no matter what I do, you can't punch me. But later what you do is you pull him aside, privately explain to him, you behoove him, you exhort him, you correct him to be able to make a change so that he's not acting like that within whatever is going on. And then maybe if you have to, you could give him a modest strike. Parents, you know how to do that, right? You know how even in the context of liturgy where sometimes you have to bring those who are under you to attention. That's an important aspect of modesty. To be able to do it in the right way, at the right time, to bring to attention. And then to save something later for something later if that's necessary. Modesty is what helps you and I to be able to live that out properly. Modesty is essential not because the body or the passions are shameful, but rather because the body is the extreme gift of God. In fact, every passion is good in say, meaning every passion is good in its very self. St. Augustine speaks about this, and I shared this at table with some of the young ladies who are preparing to venture out into the world. Modesty, as St. Augustine says, though rather the whole practice of the Christian life is an exercise of holy desire. We're not Buddhists. We're not trying to remove passion from our life. As Christians, as Catholics, as men and women of faith, as those who live out this faith in the most traditional way possible within the faith of our fathers, what we have to do is continually grow within our desires. Not to stifle them, to grow them but also then to rightly direct them toward the good. They need to be moderated, to be modestized, to make them more modest in that way so that they're ordered toward their indeed proper end, but to grow, brothers and sisters, in your desires as they become more and more holy desires. Modesty is essential for this reason. Because modesty... Is the, and the, because the natural goodness and the potential for good which the body has requires a duty to protect it from abuse, from manipulation, and from all manner of disorder. Scripture speaks about it this way. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your own body is the very temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So therefore, glorify God with what? Your body, which means with modesty, in the way in which you move about with your body. Now, what are the relations between modesty and the virtue of humility? We talked about that earlier. What is the relationship between these two? Much of what I said above could also be said about humility, couldn't it? Well, that's right. And this is a reason. It's because humility is a species of modesty. Well, that means it's a type of modesty. Modesty is the greater category, whereas humility is a part of what modesty entails. There are, in fact, three species of modesty. The first is humility, the second is studiousness, and the third is eutropelia. Fun word to say. Eutropelia, it's also fun to do, and we'll get to it in a moment, how to do it. But let's talk about humility just for a brief moment. Humility is that which recognizes the goodness of the self, but it restrains or it chastens those immoderate strivings that we might have to go beyond what we are intended for or what our excellence truly is. What humility does is it sees all things in relationship to oneself, but also in relationship to God. It puts the self in right relationship with God who is almighty. Humility orders the self in a way that allows one to desire God and God alone. Humility is that which helps the soul to desire to return to God and to return to God alone. Humility recognizes the source of all of our excellence. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11 says this. It says, each of you should use whatever gift it is that you receive to do what? To serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in all of its various forms. So your gifts which you have been given are not for you. They're for service of God and his church as he dispenses you forth. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7 says similarly, St. Paul says, Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and to Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us or of against another. For whoever makes you different from anyone else, what do you have which you did not receive? And if you did indeed receive everything it is that you had, then why do you boast as though you did not receive it? Any excellence in which you have is not of you. Any lack of excellence is more likely something of you. That's the right way of thinking. St. Paul says this, doesn't he? I forgot to look it up, but what does he say? He says, this is a trustworthy saying. Say this more often and you will grow in humility and modesty. This is a trustworthy saying. Jesus Christ, he died for sinners, among whom I am the foremost. I am the chief, among whom I am the greatest. I stop looking at the faults in others and I realize I've got too many to deal with so I need to work on me and let God take care of that. That's the trustworthy saying. Humility then, brothers and sisters, is neither a pusillanimity or smallness of soul nor is it this evil self-esteem that says, I am so great. St. Thomas tells us that humility ranks first among all the theological at first after all the theological virtues, after the intellectual virtues that regard reason itself and the virtue of justice. So after those, humility, therefore, ranks number one. St. Thomas tells us that the fruit of these two excellent virtues, meaning modesty and humility, is this. First, it'll, they allow us to fear lest we offend or sadden our neighbor in any way. So we fear to sadden or offend our neighbor in any way. Humility and modesty help us to do that. And then secondly, to be able to do everything it is that we do in a way that we think will be more pleasing to our neighbor. To actually help our neighbor go forward. 
That's why we need it. Doesn't it sound like humility and modesty happen to be the fulfillment of that second of God's great commandments that he gave us? To love God above all things and then to love our neighbor as our very selves? We see these things here for us. Modesty consists in a certain agreeableness of the kindly and peaceful soul. Hugh of St. Victor praises the modest soul, saying, quote, To show oneself lovable to one's neighbor is a sign that one is devoted to God. He is courageous to all, burdensome to none. He is kind to his neighbor because he is devoted to God. That's what humility is. Now we hit those other related parts of modesty as well. So studiousness. We'll go through it very quickly. But studiousness is only is this. It is the application of one's mind to the purpose of acquiring and extending knowledge. So studiousness is whereby we aggregate knowledge to ourselves about the word. But man, it, because it recognizes that man, he is oriented toward truth. The mind, which is the highest faculty of man, is oriented to come to know things in their reality, but we need studiousness in order to properly direct that to the right things and to make sure that you and I are not studying frivolous things. Anybody ever gone down a YouTube rabbit hole? Frivolity, that's what we call that, okay? So studiousness keeps us going in the right direction. Anybody ever gone down a, a YouTube rabbit hole just because they were studying the faith or listening to census fidelium or something like that time and time again? I know who they are. I, you already talked to me about it. Well, okay, then that inst- enters into ex- an extreme there too because you have other things to attend to in your life like children and everything else in life, right? Okay, so that's what it does. It regulates the way in which we apply our mind to come and take things into ourselves to know, knowing the right things and knowing them in the right way with the right moderation there. Now, the last one is eutropelia. Eutropelia, a fun thing to be able to say. It's even more fun to do. And what it does is it regards wittiness. It regards pleasantness. It regards nothing of boorishness and it doesn't go to the extreme, which is called buffoonery. You get into buffoonery, you've gone beyond playfulness. It means that even when we're joking or jesting, it has its limits. I'll use Stephen because he introduced me here. He is very eutropilic. He likes to joke, but sometimes he takes it a little bit too extreme, right? And then he plays the fool and becomes a buffoon, okay? He knows that, we know that, we're all restraining it. But actually, buffoonery is a little bit closer to the virtue than boorishness is because you got to be light of soul. It's necessary to relieve weariness. Play should always be ordered, though, at the same time. One should not be overly dull. And this, because why? St. Thomas says this is burdensome to others, to be overly dull. Don't be dull. We're Catholic. We're Catholic, so that means we like wine. We like beer. We like hanging out and doing great things, always in moderation. But we're not prudish in these ways and keeping them and saying that they're no good and saying that we got to be like Puritans and never celebrate. That's why Christmas is a Catholic holiday. And only Charles Dickens was able to save that for the Protestants. Catholics always celebrate. We fast, but then we rejoice in feasting. That was discussed earlier this week. Senseless mirth is the vice that is to be avoided by all. Meaning enjoying things that have no sense or enjoying things that are ribald or beneath your nature and mind. What about the allies that help you and I to be able to practice the virtue to be able to gain modesty? First, shame. If you're taking notes, these are good things to take notes on, by the way. Shame. Shame helps you to, because what it does is it fills the body with a holy bashfulness, which makes us unwilling to admit any thought or action by which we may deserve the contempt of respectable people. Therefore, shame most carefully shuns all looks, all touches, all words and the like, which the concupiscence of the flesh may become overly excited by. So that's what shame does keeps you and I from going too far in all these areas. Another thing that is allied to be able to help you and I practice modesty is that of modesty itself. Modesty regulates all the exterior actions according to right reason in the demands of one's state and life. The third is self-restraint. 
Self-restraint strengthens the will power to, that it may not be forced to unbecoming things by the inordinate affections of the heart. What does our Lord say? He says, or St. Paul says, who can judge the heart of man? It goes in all sorts of directions. That's why we need self-restraint to be able to go forward. Mortification is the fourth. Mortification is the medium and instrument by which the body is reduced to the service of the soul and all rebellion is duly curved. Somebody was talking to me uh, within the past couple of days so that I don't give out their identity that the thing that helped them to restrain them in the practice of six commandment vices was the fact that they were given as a penance and proclaimed from the pulpit, you gotta fast. And when they began to do that, just like the scripture, just like the lives of the saints show, those things began to flee. And the last ally to help you practice the virtue of modesty is this. It's called self-distrust. And so that you don't rely on Father Burnaby for the words, I'm going to give you the words of a man by the name of Father Lawrence Scupoli who wrote um, that great book on spiritual combat. This is from number 19. He says this. Do not be too trustful of yourself, even though you do not know the feel of the stings of the flesh do not now feel the stings of the flesh and have not felt it for the years you have enjoyed the friendships of so many souls for this the cursed vice can in one hour wrest from us what has not been obtained in many years frequently there is cause for greater fear as the experience is taught and daily and daily teaches when a friendship is cultivated under pleasurable reasons i.e. a relationship or a duty or the virtue of one's friend. Again, I say to you, flee. You are as tender and you are not to be trusted even though you are saturated and filled with the moisture of willpower and are more ready to die than to offend God. When the fire of concupiscence burns unnoticed and dries up the water of our strong will by cherishing such friendship, it will flare up so wildly that it will regard neither relative nor friend. God will not be feared. Reputation, life, the punishments of hell, however numerous, will be disregarded. Therefore, says Lawrence Scupoli, Flee! Flee! He says, flee, unless perchance you wish to be overtaken, seen, and finally slain. For this reason, if you and I are going to have those allies that help you and I to be able to acquire modesty for ourselves with our lives, we have to have distrust of self, even above all things, as Lord Scupoli teaches us. Modesty, as Father Cibelli spoke about, is the virtue of religion. It's part of the virtue of religion. So then it touches on justice, doesn't it? If modesty is the virtue of religion whereby we give back to the infinite God what we are able to give, which includes the offering of Him of our very persons, our bodies, our souls, in a faithful, steadfast love. Thus, modesty is both a consequent and a safeguard of the virtue of religion. St. Thomas speaks about it this way. He says, holiness requires two things. First, being clean, and secondly, being firm. Modesty requires those two things, holiness rather, clean and firm. As the scripture says, Matthew chapter 5, our Lord says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the clean of heart. For what? They shall see God. Even more so, brothers and sisters, than modesty, blessed are they who firmly persevere, preserve their purity of soul and body so they can love God more fully with their whole being and all that they are. We need modesty in order to actually love God with our bodies, glorify God with your bodies, as St. Saint, Saint Paul. Now, is modesty the same in every single person? What do you think? I'm asking the question, so the answer is probably no, right? That's right. It is not the same for everyone. Modesty falls under the cardinal virtue of temperance, as I've already spoken about, and so all virtue is relative to the person, to the circumstance, and even to the society. 
Thomas says that justice has an arithmetic mean. So when we discuss justice in Father's homily the other day, it means that it can always be objectively known. You can always know what is just in a given situation. All you need to know is all the facts about it. And then you know how to rule justly. It's an arithmetic mean. You can figure it out. But not so with temperance and not so with modesty. Because so much is relative to the person, to the place, and to every little factor that could possibly be there. So we can only give you principles to help you to go forward. For example, think about table etiquette. What do you do when you sit at a table? Do you sit there? Is it something that's fine to be able to put your elbows on the table? I'm going to tell you absolutely not. I'm going to tell you absolutely not. But in some places, that's absolutely right. What about how do you use all the various implements that are gathered around there? Where do they go? Which side do they go on? Do you even have them or not? Do you sit on the floor? Or do you sit in a chair? Or is the table set in this way or that way? Does the silverware or does the dishes get passed from left to right or from right to left? Who gets served first? All these things are relative to the culture, to the situations that are going on within you. You can't know them outside. They're all related to customs including even how do you give an affirmation to the cook saying the food is great. Do you turn to them and say so? Do you arrange your dishes or your napkin a particular way upon the plate? Or do you let out a, for me, discourteous noise from your belly through your mouth and that recognizes that that was really good? Some cultures say that that's the right way to be able to do so. That you've got to make noises while you eat. Otherwise, the cook will be offended and think you do not like it something to be conscious of within your own life. So then what should be our motivation for living out modesty? Here's a good reason. Because if you are modest, it reflects well upon our religion. If you're immodest, it reflects poorly upon our religion. We become bad co-religionists, bad representatives of our religion, if we do not behave modestly. What do we find? There's a man by the name of Dennis Prager, a very faithful Jew who I love quite a bit. He's a wise radio personality and a Torah commentator who frequently says that a happy person is the best advertisement for one's religion. And it's absolutely true. You want somebody to come and be a part of St. Stephen's, don't be a curmudgeon. Be joyful. Joy attracts. Many of you are here specifically because you saw something different. You saw joy. And that drew you in to see the joy, which is the joy of the Lord, which is the actual fruit of knowing that you're loved by God, but you saw it in another person before you found it in God himself. And so we see it here. Our Lord says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, He says, So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. A Carmelite by the name of Saint Anthony, uh, or Father Anthony of the Holy Spirit, teaches us this. He says, quote, You will more easily become an orator by modesty of life than by eloquence of tongue. For the latter only moves, but the former draws. Eloquent modesty is of greater value than a noisy tongue because he who talks too much proves that he's a fool. End quotation. So in the time remaining, practical issues. Practical issues. This is the part where you guard your heart because I'm going to talk about things that maybe you don't want to hear about. So that was, your, uh, that was your trigger warning if you need one of those. So modesty. Let's talk about modesty with regard to speech. It means that our speech should follow good grammar. If you're not using good grammar, you're not, you're not being modest within your speech. I personally use bad grammar intentionally because I'm being a little eutropelic. But if you're using it just casually as a part of your manner, you need to correct that. That's not good. That's not modest speaking. We should speak in a way that uplifts other people. Speak only when it is necessary. Speak only when it is near. The vice of loquaciousness is when you and I love the pleasure of the sound of one's own voice or to have a crowd under your captivity when you have everybody's eyeballs glued to you. That's the great fear that the preacher has. You've got to pray for Father with regard to that. Don't want that to be the case. Uh, it's really helpful for me when I don't wear my glasses so I can't see how enjoyable you're taking for this. And I just assume that you're all scowling at me the whole time. 
Maybe that's the case or not. I can't see, so I don't know. Loquaciousness is not something that we should be striving for, but rather speaking prof- not speaking directly what it is that we mean, to make sure that we say exactly what it is that we should say. St. John Chrysostom, the great doctor of the church, says that you and I should be so careful while preaching. He's speaking to priests. You and I should be so careful when we're preaching just as we are careful when we're celebrating the Mass. That just as you and I are so careful that not the smallest crumb should fall from the sacred table to scoop it all up, he says that you and I as preachers should make sure that not even a single syllable falls carelessly from our lips. High bar, is that not? So it should be. The lack of due moderation in speaking what needs to be spoken as secret, sacred scripture teaches, quote, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, say only the good things that men need to hear, the things that will really help them. So that means don't bring up issues that are going to call your brothers and sisters to fall, speaking about them in the wrong company, sharing knowledge with people that they're not ready to be able to receive yet. You and I have to be brothers keepers with our speech as well making sure that we do not expose one another to things that will ultimately lead us to sin or give somebody a freedom which is too much for them to be able to hold on to. Guard your speech. Guard your words. In fact, to regard the former point, St. James, read the book of James. It's one of my favorite books. Read it. It's so short, just five chapters. St. James talks a lot about the tongue with regard to that, and I'll commend that to you so that we can keep moving. The Discaus Carmelite Father Philip of the Holy Trinity says this. He says, The perfect man must therefore be always and everywhere of earnest, humble, and serious countenance, but modestly cheerful toward everyone. He should especially guard his eyes in modesty, having them under control and not curious, and when necessary, slightly raised, but usually they should be lowered. He's speaking to religious, I should note that, but it's something that you and I should take as well. Particularly with our eyes, you may notice that when the priest comes in, that he's not directed, he's directed to keep modesty of eyes such that he won't even look at the crucifix until finally he raises them up in preparation for the gospel. So in the same way, you and I should have due modesty as well with we're, we're here in Mass. I was going to discuss this in a separate section, but I probably won't now since I'm addressing it here. There's a thing called rubbernecking. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that is? You know what that is? Now you do. That's what I was just doing right there. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta rebuke you all a little bit for this. Yesterday, I saw a lot of rubbernecking. A lot of people looking. The first thing that pops up all over the place. I don't know why there was such disturbance as there was among no other of the talks that were going on. Maybe it was just an exhausting week already at that point. But to avoid that rubbernecking, to avoid turning your head to every little thing, that's one of the great graces that you women have in wearing those chapel veils. You shouldn't just wear the ones that are just on top of your head. Bring them there so that they can be as they are, truly blinders. Then you won't have to worry about those things. And you can focus all the more at the only person who is important. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ who is here in the Blessed Sacrament, who is truly here present for us, right? Don't do rubbernecking. Avoid that at all costs. That's what modesty does in controlling our body when we're here at worship. To move on, he says still more, Father Philip of the Holy Trinity, the Carmelite, he says, he must not be inclined to laughter. But when there is a becoming occasion for laughing, he will be careful not to laugh so boisterously, but modestly and becomingly. For gushing laughter is unbecoming to the austere humility of the perfect man. That's offensive because some of us have really great laughs. And I don't. So I really appreciate it when you have those big belly laughs. They make me feel like I'm participating in something that I have no idea how to do and I long for so much. But in due moderation, in due moderation, even to restrain the outward expression of our laughter as something that befits our state in life and where we happen to be. He continues on to say his carriage 
should be not of weak and effeminate, but dignified and simple, free from affection, neither too fast nor too slow. So when you walk about, to walk about with that very carriage which is there, not to be weak and effeminate as though you're going in some sort of way that even the slightest breeze is going to knock you over, but to do so confidently. When I was studying, I used to study flamenco dance when I was in college. And so taking that course there, I learned a lot of things. By the way, I was the second best man in, in the class. Did you know that? I'm bragging here a little bit, maybe above myself. I was the second best man in the entirety of the class, even though it was just my first year. Uh, but I should probably tell you there were only two men in the class. So that goes to show that. But what Our Lady told us, Eva Insigne Santoval, she was so good. What she taught us is she was talking to the young women and saying, you got to carry your chest up. You gotta roll your shoulders back. You gotta stand beneath yourself upon your sits bones right here and you charge into things and you make yourself to be a force to be reckoned with. You can do that in utter humility because you indeed are a force to be reckoned with. Every single one of you young women and men who are out here, I already told you, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost yourselves. God lives within you. And so act like it. Walk like it. Present yourself to the world like it, with that carriage, dignified but simple, free from of over-affection, neither walking too fast nor creeping too slowly. You'll see that as the men come in for Mass, and you'll also notice that that Father has to walk that way because he doesn't wear shoes. Not wearing shoes means that he cannot run too quickly and makes him less fit for doing anything but the work of God. Finally, we must, he must always observe usage of politeness. Unless perhaps some usages among the seculars are opposed to devout humility because it does not destroy the nature, but it perfects some matters it corrects. Now, I only got to one particular aspect, which is here. I knew we were going to run out of time, but I wasn't sure how far it was going to go. So I will conclude with these words as soon as I find them here. Philippians chapter 4 verse 5. It says, Let your modesty be known before all men. And these words are explained by Father Anthony the Holy Spirit. He says, it is as though he said, let your knowledge be hidden, your prudence, your meekness, your temperance, but let your modesty be hidden from no man. Let it be clear to all and known by all men in order that you may be known. Let your modesty be known to all men because the eyes of all are turned upon you. Let it therefore be known to the heathen, to the Mohammedan, that they may acknowledge the true God. Let it be known to the heretics that they may be converted to the faith. Let it be known to all Christians that they may be strengthened in the faith. Let it be known to all by the, by the sight of it that they may indeed be reformed. This is so true that modesty should be carefully guarded in all reformed orders and that the character of the novices be recognized by their modesty, for I have never seen one remarkable for modesty who was not also admirable in every one of the virtues. Rather, on the contrary, those whom I saw lacking in modesty, I afterwards discovered to be very bad religious persons indeed. Father Anthony, the Holy Spirit, the Carmelite, speaks in this way. And so we end as we begin. You and I should be able to say about all those who live modesty and those who come and visit you here at St. Stephen's or wherever it is that you call home within the Catholic world to say of you, as St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, Bene gaude, gaudent, gaudeant bene nati sunt. Let the noble born rejoice. For whatever they do, whatever they say, it is pleasing, because in all humility 
in all simplicity, in all beauty, they shine forth from that person. And so that you and I may be all the more ready for these graces. Let us go before the Lord, praying the most simple and easiest of all two prayers, two of the ones we earliest acknowledged. The glory be. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.